Israel just released one million living fish into a river that didn't exist five years ago. Not a natural stream fed by mountain snowmelt or seasonal rainfall. An entirely engineered waterway carved through one of the driest deserts on Earth, where annual precipitation barely reaches 100 millimeters in some zones. The water flowing through this channel isn't rainwater either. It's treated wastewater, liquid that was sewage less than 48 hours before fish started swimming in it. Scientists are now watching closely to see if nature will accept this artificial system or reject it in ways no one anticipated. If you're into mega projects that push engineering and ecology to their absolute limits, make sure to subscribe, hit like, and drop a comment on whether you think this experiment will succeed or collapse. Here's what most people don't realize about this river. Every drop flowing through the Negev Desert comes from wastewater treatment plants not desalination facilities or aquifers. Israel reuses roughly 90% of its wastewater, the highest rate of any country on the planet. But using treated effluent for agriculture is one thing. Building an entire river ecosystem on it is something no nation has attempted at this scale. The purification process removes solids, pathogens, and most nitrogen compounds, bringing the water to what regulators call ecological standards. But environmental engineers know that even advanced treatment systems struggle with trace contaminants. Studies on treated wastewater released into streams worldwide have documented a troubling pattern. Organic micropollutants, pharmaceutical residues, and emerging chemical compounds frequently pass through filtration systems in concentrations too low to regulate but high enough to affect aquatic life over time. Some researchers have quietly raised concerns about whether long-term exposure could alter fish reproduction, behavior, or immune function in ways that won't show up for years. Israel's engineers installed continuous monitoring stations to track water quality in real time. But they're essentially running a live experiment with variables no one fully controls. What happens if those hidden contaminants start accumulating in fish tissue or sediment? That question doesn't have an answer yet. Desert rivers face a challenge that most ecosystems never encounter. Water temperatures can swing violently between day and night, sometimes fluctuating by 15 to 20 degrees Celsius within a 24-hour period. Shallow channels heat rapidly under direct sunlight, pushing temperatures toward levels that stress even the hardiest species. Fish need dissolved oxygen to survive, and warm water holds significantly less oxygen than cold water. When temperatures spike during summer heat waves, oxygen levels can drop fast enough to trigger mass die-offs within hours. Israeli researchers didn't pick random fish for this release. They selected tilapia and carp specifically because these species tolerate thermal shock better than most. Tilapia can survive sudden temperature changes that would kill more sensitive fish outright. Carp adapt to fluctuating conditions and low oxygen environments. But even resilient species have limits. Push them too far, and the entire population can collapse before anyone notices the warning signs. That's why automated sensors were placed along the river to monitor dissolved oxygen and temperature around the clock. These systems send alerts the moment readings shift into dangerous territory, giving technicians a narrow window to intervene before the damage becomes irreversible. And this is where the next problem starts to reveal itself. By March 2025, researchers found something unexpected. Tilapia fry, juvenile fish, were discovered in shallow, plant-sheltered zones near the riverbanks. The fish weren't just surviving, they were reproducing naturally. For most ecological restoration projects, this would be celebrated as a major milestone. It means the environment is stable enough to support a full life cycle. But in a closed desert system with limited space and carefully controlled water flow, rapid reproduction introduces a serious risk. Overpopulation can destabilize young ecosystems faster than almost any other factor. When fish multiply too quickly, oxygen demand surges. Waste production increases. Algae blooms accelerate as nutrient levels rise from decomposing organic matter. If the population grows beyond what the system can support, the entire food web can collapse into what ecologists call a dead zone. A section of water so depleted of oxygen that nothing survives. Israel's monitoring network was designed precisely for this scenario. Real-time data tracking ensures that if oxygen levels start dropping or nutrient concentrations spike, environmental teams can respond immediately. If this surprised you, hit like so more people understand the risks hiding behind these success stories. 
But even perfect monitoring can't solve the next challenge. This river only exists because treatment plants run constantly. Purified wastewater is pumped through underground pipelines into the desert channel, maintaining a steady flow that mimics a natural stream. Unlike rivers fed by rain, snowmelt, or underground springs, this system requires uninterrupted human intervention. Electricity to power the treatment plants. Chemical inputs for purification. Skilled operators to maintain equipment. Political and financial commitment to keep the infrastructure funded. If any part of this chain breaks down, the river dies. Some environmental engineers have raised concerns about what they describe as an expensive life support system rather than true ecological restoration. A natural river can survive droughts, adapt to seasonal changes, and recover from temporary disruptions. An engineered river dependent on industrial infrastructure is vulnerable to equipment failures, energy shortages, economic crises, or political instability. In a region where conflict and resource competition remain constant pressures, some experts question whether long-term sustainability is realistic. Israel has maintained its wastewater treatment systems for decades, achieving the highest reuse rate on Earth. But the scale of commitment needed to sustain an entire desert ecosystem indefinitely goes beyond anything attempted before. And then there's the issue of what's actually in the water. Advanced wastewater treatment can eliminate most pollutants, but not all of them. Trace pharmaceuticals, microplastics, and emerging chemical compounds frequently remain in concentrations. Regulators consider negligible. The problem is that negligible for human health standards doesn't always mean safe for aquatic ecosystems over multi-generational timescales. Research on effluent fed streams in other countries has shown a troubling pattern. Even when treated wastewater meets ecological flow standards, biodiversity often declines over time. Sensitive species disappear. Pollution-tolerant organisms take over. Reproductive abnormalities appear in fish populations exposed to long-term chemical mixtures. These effects aren't immediate. They accumulate slowly, sometimes taking years before they become noticeable. Israel's monitoring systems track major water quality indicators like oxygen, temperature, and nutrient levels. But detecting subtle shifts in fish health or long-term contaminant buildup in sediment requires a different kind of surveillance. Scientists involved in the project haven't reported major problems yet, but the timeline is still short. The real question is what happens after a decade of continuous exposure. Will fish populations remain stable? Will reproduction rates stay healthy? Or will researchers eventually discover effects that don't show up in the first few years? Subscribe if you want to follow how this unfolds, because the answer could change how the world thinks about water reuse. And beyond the science, there's a bigger strategy at play. Israel's wastewater reuse infrastructure isn't just about environmental restoration. In a region where water scarcity drives conflict and political leverage, the ability to create ecosystems from treated effluent represents a strategic advantage. Neighboring countries are watching this project closely. Delegations from Jordan, Morocco, and the United Arab Emirates have already visited to study the systems and methods. These nations face accelerating water crises of their own, and Israel's model offers a potential pathway forward. But here's the reality some experts emphasize. This approach works only under specific conditions. It requires massive infrastructure investment, advanced treatment technology, stable governance, and consistent funding. Most countries lack one or more of these elements. Building treatment plants capable of producing ecological-grade water costs hundreds of millions of dollars. Maintaining them requires skilled labor, reliable electricity, and long-term political commitment. For nations dealing with economic instability or conflict, replicating Israel's model isn't realistic in the near term. That doesn't diminish the project's importance. It shows what's possible when resources align. But it also highlights the gap between innovation in wealthy, technologically advanced nations and the reality facing most water-stressed regions. The question isn't just whether this river survives. It's whether the lessons learned here can be adapted by countries without Israel's infrastructure capacity. And that brings up the most critical uncertainty of all. Ecological systems don't stabilize overnight. Trees take decades to mature. Soil microbiomes develop gradually. Food webs reach equilibrium only after years of uninterrupted conditions. Israel is betting that continuous wastewater flow can sustain this desert river indefinitely. 
maintaining the stability needed for long-term ecological development. But no engineered desert river fed entirely by treated effluent has existed long enough to prove this assumption. A single infrastructure failure could reverse years of progress in a matter of weeks. A prolonged drought affecting wastewater production, a treatment plant malfunction, a political shift that redirects funding priorities. Any of these scenarios could disrupt the water supply long enough to collapse the ecosystem. Fish populations would die off first, vegetation would follow as moisture disappears. Birds and insects would abandon the area. Within months, the river could revert to dry sand. Some environmental researchers argue that true restoration requires reducing dependency on artificial inputs over time, allowing natural processes to take over. But in a desert where rainfall is almost non-existent, natural processes can't sustain a permanent river. The system will always require human intervention. The question is whether that intervention can remain consistent for decades or whether economic, political, or environmental pressures will eventually force compromises. Comment below whether you think this river will still be flowing in 2035. If this river stabilizes and becomes self-regulating within its engineered constraints, it proves something profound. Countries facing ecological collapse from water scarcity can engineer their way toward recovery, rebuilding ecosystems that seemed permanently lost. The implications extend beyond Israel. Desert regions across the Middle East, North Africa, and parts of Asia could adapt similar strategies, using treated wastewater to restore degraded landscapes. But if hidden contaminants accumulate, fish populations crash, or infrastructure dependency proves unsustainable, it reveals the hard limits of treating wastewater as a replacement for natural water cycles. It would suggest that artificial ecosystems, no matter how carefully engineered, can't replicate the resilience and adaptability of natural systems shaped by millions of years of evolution. The next five to 10 years will determine which outcome unfolds. Researchers will continue monitoring water quality, fish health, vegetation spread, and biodiversity trends. Every data point collected adds to the global understanding of what works and what doesn't when humans try to reverse ecological degradation in extreme environments. And the world is paying attention because the lessons learned here could influence environmental policy and infrastructure investment decisions for decades. We're watching the early days of an experiment that could redefine how humans interact with desert landscapes. The million fish are still swimming. Vegetation is spreading along the banks. Birds are returning to areas where water hasn't flowed naturally in generations. But the real test hasn't begun. Will this river still exist in 2035? Will fish populations remain stable? Or will unforeseen biological or chemical factors start to disrupt the balance? Engineers design this system to last indefinitely. But nature has a way of finding vulnerabilities that calculations miss. The technology is proven, the monitoring is cutting edge. The early results look promising, but the margin between success and collapse in a system this artificial is thinner than most people realize. One prolonged heat wave, one contaminant spike, one infrastructure failure at the wrong moment. Any of these could unravel what took years to build. If you want to follow how this story develops and see whether engineered ecosystems can truly replace what nature once provided, subscribe to the channel, hit like, and let us know in the comments what you think the future holds for projects like this. Because what happens in the Negev Desert over the next decade could shape environmental strategy across every water-stressed region on Earth.